Welcome everyone to another Leadership Legends interview. Today, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Michael Love, Associate Professor of Counseling and Honors Program Counselor here at Riverside City College. Thank you for allowing me to uh, interview today and have our audience get to know your story and your academic journey. Mr. Love, thank you for being here today. I thank appreciate you for, for your time. Uh, so let's get to it, man. Let's start asking some of these questions so right. our audience can get to know you a little bit more. Okay. So first question, who is Michael Love outside of Riverside City College? So you're not counseling. You're, you're going home. Like, who is really Michael Love? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I'm excited to be in the space with you today. Um, I started to hear a little bit about the buzz that you were picking yeah. up with the yeah. podcast. So I'm like, yo, I need to be a part of that. <laughs> Thank so you. if I had to talk about who I am outside of counseling, uh, I would think that I bring the same passion, creativity, dedication, silliness that I have in my professional life and my personal life. Um, I would definitely say that I am a self-proclaimed big kid. Okay. Uh, I love Pokemon still. Um, right. I got an opportunity last month to attend WrestleMania with my big brother, so still a wrestling fan. Okay. Um, I absolutely love sneakers. I'm a sneakerhead, so yeah. I would say that the same energy that I put into my professional life being a counselor, it carries over into my personal life. I just have an opportunity to be more of the big kid that I am naturally. So Pokemon, wrestling, mm -hmm. is that, how, how do people react to that when because for me, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Wow. You know, I thought Pokemon was done. Like, that done deal back <laughs> in the 90s. So what does it look like now? I tell my students that the, I try to set the tone, even in my office, the way that my office looks is really, the energy that I bring is really there. So for the most part, I think that my students feed into it and they can connect to it because I, I identify as closer in age to a lot of my students. I'm still the, the youngest counselor on our, our counseling <laughs> team, so... Um, when I started early on, I felt that it, it may have hindered me because I'm trying to project this yeah. professional person mm. and my age is saying, oh, but you look like one of us. Interesting. It took me a yeah. while to get into it, just lean into it and, and realize that that type of energy that I bring, that creativity, that big kidness, it allows me to connect with students in other ways. So That's I try cool. to use it to my benefit. Cool. So sports, you into sports besides Ab wrestling? Come on, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Die hard. How about you tell our audience what kind of sports you're into, man? <laughs> Die hard, San Francisco 49ers fan. Okay. Heard okay. about the last couple of seasons, but we're there. Die hard, Atlanta Braves fan. Um, love the Braves as long as they're not playing the San Diego Padres because I'm from okay. San Diego. Okay. Um, off top, I'm an alumni of San Diego State, so all San right. Diego sports gets played. Okay. Um, excited absolutely a sports fan boxing okay everything except nascar and hockey gotcha, gotcha. just about it's just about okay. just about now with through all of that as a you know kid growing up mm -hmm. was academics in your home like was talking about going to college was that a topic that was common at home for you besides the whole experience of sports and the, the leisure stuff you do? Absolutely not. Hmm. Absolutely not. I am a first generation college student. Shout out to all of our first yeah. generation college first students. Gents. I know the struggle. Okay. Uh, my mom was, uh, was a young parent. Uh, my father wasn't around. So school was pressed and you need to go to school because you need to get an opportunity to get a better paying job and career. Okay. But it wasn't anything that I felt was like nourishing that educational um, want. I figured out real early that school was something that I liked. Okay. Um, and it's definitely not. I, I realized how different that is for most of the students that I work with. The majority of the men of color that I work with are yeah. not attached to enjoying school. Ooh. For me, it was okay. a way for me to get out. Like so that. I knew I'm, 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 I can play basketball, right. but I'm not good enough to get a scholarship. I can rap and sing a little bit, but I'm not good enough to get paid for it. Gotcha. So it was like, what other options do you have? And education was that for me. So I love being at school. I felt safe at school. Okay. So for me, the transition from being at home to being a student scholar, um, it, it wasn't a hard transition. I, I gravitated towards the energy. So talking about that, let I would like you to tell our students, how was your academic journey? Was it like 
for example, mine, I went to community college, Cal State, private school. That was my journey. What was your journey like in the higher education? I was so, so privileged to have individuals at each level of education who took a chance on me and, and truly saw my potential. Um, I was taking, uh, and I go back to this, I remember it was my fourth grade teacher. Oh, wow. Shout out to Fran Serber. I'll never forget her okay. name. Okay. She was the very first teacher that I had that told me, hey, you know what, you're good at writing. You should keep doing it. Hmm. I love to read. Um, I got into reading really early, and I realized for me, reading was an opportunity to get away. So I can get caught up in stories. I can get yeah. caught up in history. And I didn't have to be in the space that I was in. So my fourth grade teacher was the very first one that said, hey, you're good at this. Wow. Keep going. And I get to middle school, uh, Miss Davis, shout out to Miss Davis. That was my chemistry yes. teacher in middle school. Yes. Um, again, science is not my energy, but she was another individual that saw potential in me and was like, I see this and you continue to go. I get to high school and uh, my high school mentor is still my mentor to this day. Funny thing, we have the same name. Shout out to Mr. Love in San Diego. Um, he oh, wow. got a so chance. He was my AVID teacher. Okay. Had him three years in AVID and then also had him as a statistics teacher. Hmm. And he really opened my eyes to what options that I had. Yeah. I all, always knew that I wanted to go to college. Yeah. I just didn't know how to get there. So I, I connected with him. I got a chance to do a, a summer bridge program and an upward bound program because oh, wow. of him. So after high school, I graduated and went straight to San Diego State. I did my bachelor's there in four years, uh, graduated, took a year off, and then went back and got my master's degree in uh, educational leadership, okay. also at San Diego State, which allowed me to do this. Okay. Um, and now I'm in my second year of my doctoral program at Cal State San Bernardino. Okay. That's so awesome. I realized that my journey has been different because I didn't have a community college experience. Right. But now that I work at one, I realize that the the experience that students have here, mm -hmm. it, it really does a, a wonderful job yes. of not only instilling those student traits on how to be a student, how to be successful, but also giving them that foundation to, to push forward. So I, like I didn't that. have an experience at the community college, but I can see now how valuable those experiences are. And I'm so thankful to be working at one. I love how you say that where you had all this support even from fourth grade, high school. What I hear is you constantly got involved. Yeah. You know, no one forced you. You know, no one said, where well, are you going to do this? It's more like you got involved. Hey, I got, you know, the upper bound program Absolutely. or whatever's out there. You know, and for the people watching, you know, here at Riverside City College, we have a lot of stuff that you guys can be part of to get that, not necessarily foundation, but more support. Right. Definitely. So one of the things that I always tell students is what do you want to be part of? Right. Um, so one of the things, too, besides you going to college, you say higher education or college wasn't really spoken at home. Mm -hmm. Would you say was it just more like, hey, you would come back from school and do your homework and hey, mom and be good? Or was it, hey, Michael, we got to talk about going to college. Was there anything like that? Because neither one of my parents, especially my mom, went to college, yeah. I think those conversations were wanting to help but not knowing how to help. Mm. So I, I realized pretty early, like once I got into middle school, yeah. what I was learning, it was like, okay, I probably won't be able to get that support from home. Gotcha. So I need to look for mentors. I need to look around to other individuals who are doing this, who are able to give me that direction. And it, it definitely helped, but I can... I can see now in my own experience how having that parental support, yeah. it matters. matters. It absolutely matters. Interesting, because it, it, it's good to hear where you probably didn't have the conversation at home, but look at you here in your second year of doctoral program. Definitely. So it's doable, okay? It's absolutely. possible doing it. Um, but with that, you know, transitioning from your education, the influence, people inspiring you to do things, um, can you recall a moment in your life where you felt the most vulnerable, and how did you overcome it, man? You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of our students out there are going through tough stuff, and they think we never go through tough stuff. So what what moment in your life you realize, oh, snaps, I need help? Can you recall a moment of that? 
I too, um, what I would say to, to first answer that question is depression is real. Mm. And the, yeah. the concept of mental health and being able to reach out for help is so vitally important. And it's not just for huge problems. It could be right. everyday things that we go through. I, I vividly remember, I vividly remember 2011 and 2017 as those low points for me. Um, I graduated with my master's in 2011 and I was on unemployment for six months. Hmm. I was going out, I was 22 and I had a degree but I was super young and didn't have any experience. So the jobs that I wanted and was applying for, I was getting denied. You don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. I got to work. So the jobs that I don't want, I was also getting denied because I'm overqualified. Um, I remember once I graduated, I had my bachelor's and my master's degree up on my wall. Um, after about two months of being on unemployment, I took them down off my wall and put mm -hmm. them under my bed. And it messed me up because mentally I'm thinking I did what I was supposed to do. They right. said go to college, yeah. they said get the degree, but there's no job on the, other, on the other end of that. And mentally I wasn't prepared for that. Wow. I started, I got a chance to get in adjuncting at a community college down in San Diego okay. where I'm from. And I did that for two, three years. I was working at two different community colleges and then it became three. And I'm looking at the landscape of individuals who are getting full-time jobs and I'm like, okay, well, why not me? Right, right. So 2017 was a other point where I'm working and I have five years experience under my belt. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting the full-time positions that I want and I'm starting to get, started Damn to get disillusioned because yeah, okay. I'm, I'm applying like crazy yeah. and getting those emails that say, thank you mm -hmm. for the application, <laughs> but we've chosen a different candidate. Yeah. And they just kept racking up and yeah. in my mind. I'm thinking, can you, can you really do this? Interesting. When I started counseling, my mentor told me you'd be adjuncting or doing it part-time for five years. And after five years, you can go in and confidently have interviews for full time. Yeah. And she didn't lie to me. Five years and two weeks is when I was hired here to RCC. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I think about that, that journey yeah. and, uh, Real. I, I've spoken about that to some yeah. people. And I'm like five years. Yeah. Didn't take me five and some yeah. people is longer, some yeah. people are shorter, but that process for me of getting the degree and not having the job immediately and then working for five years, like I'm ready for it and not getting those opportunities. So it was a test of yeah. perseverance. I like how you said that the, the whole mental health and depression is real. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think we do experience it. It's something we just don't identify it. Definitely. Uh, we just think we just had a bad day. Uh, but the reality is, here's Mr. Michael Love, experienced something, he's de he dealt with it, and now he's in a second year doctoral program. So once again, I go back to what I say to everyone every single time is there's no excuses. You know, if done. you find you're going through something, we have individuals like myself and Michael here to support you. But if you guys will see, there's a, a set of ties right here. Um, you guys may say, hey, what is that tie for, man? I mean... Is that a new decoration for the for the uh, legends here? Um, what it is is that, and now you know what? How about you, Michael? You talk about the purpose of this tie, and with that, Michael's gonna give us a little tutorial about how to actually wear a tie or how to do a tie, right? All right. Go so ahead. my my experience as a young professional, um, I started counseling. I was twenty five. Uh, as a black man doing this profession, yeah. so many of the students that I would work with expect the counselor to look a certain way. Ooh, they okay. expect it to be yeah. someone who doesn't look like me, someone who's older. Right. So my thought process, and my mother told me this as I was young, she told me to dress for the dress for your boss's position. Oh, I like that. Say that again. She Say told again. me to dress not for what you have now but dress for your boss's position oh, I like that. how you yeah. dress is how people will address you Ooh. so mentally once i started as a profession i knew that i had to yeah. i had to look the part gotcha. because i if i come in a certain way yeah. which is where i'm comfortable in yeah. i'm not going to get that same respect okay so what i started to do um i created this in san diego i do believe this is the 10th year okay um, i run a tie donation drive where i get ties donated from all over the country and I run workshops where I teach students all around Southern California how to tie ties and the importance of being a professional. Interesting. So I, I always keep a tie with me. I have them in my car. I have them in my office. Um, I wanted to quickly demonstrate uh, two of them that I show students in my workshops. 
just along the lines of understanding the importance of professionalism. And I tell students my motto, I took this from Deion Sanders, shout out to Primetime. All right, Primetime. Uh, yeah. When I look good, I'm confident. When I'm confident, I can do my job to the best of my ability. And when I do that, then I'm able to inspire. Dion's quote says, if you look good, you play good. And if you play good, they pay good. <laughs> so I always I like that kept one. that in mind. I like pay good. I like that. All right. So real quick, yeah. uh, what I realized once I started as a professional, my mom taught me how to tie my first tie. Um, I was 16 and going for a award ceremony, and I didn't know how to do it. So she would tie it in the bathroom, looking at the mirror. Right. She would tie the knot. She would take it off of her neck, put it on my neck, and then tighten it up. And then once I realized how to do it, I'm like, oh, I'm never doing that. <laughs> so I tell my students when I go over this, there are thousands, literally thousands of ways to tie ties. YouTube has been absolutely amazing in showing different opportunities or different varieties. But for most individuals who are not wearing this every day, um, the four in one hand knot, which I'll show you now, was probably the easiest one that I've learned how to do. And it's the one that my students pick up the quickest. So put this around my neck. Now I am right handed. So that's my power hand. So my big end will be in my right hand. I tell my students, if you're left handed, then flip it. So very basic to start. I make sure that the tip of the skinnier end is right above my belly button. I'm going to first take the big end, cross it over. So that's right to left. I'm going to hold that in the middle. Then I'm going to take the big end. We're going to go behind that way. I'm going to grab this on the other side. So now the seam of the big end is facing towards you. Right, right. So at this point, we're going to go over and up. I'm gonna pull this all the way up. Now, tip of the big end, we're gonna stick this in the pocket that we have here. I'm gonna pull this all the way through. Ratchet this up on my neck a little bit while pulling down on the skinnier end. And then you got to tie. <laughs> nice. I Literally like one of the easiest knots that I've shown. And I go over this uh, about a good two, three times. Students that I'm working with in my workshops usually pick this up the fastest. Um, the one that gives me the most conversation is showing students how to tie the regular length tie into a bow tie. Now, when I learned how to tie a bow tie, um, I do believe I was in my 20s. I had received a bow tie, a traditional one for my birthday one year, and I could not figure out how to do it. My girlfriend at the time figured it out after two days and was trying to show me and I'm being stubborn, like, no, let me do it. So it took me about a full week to get it. And then that very next day, I had a friend who sent me a YouTube clip on how to take a full length tie and tie it to a bow tie. And I was like, that's so much easier. I'm not buying bow ties anymore. Yeah. So this is the style that I teach my students real quick. Okay. Uh, this only works if you have the tie keep. That's a little piece of fabric on the back here. If your tie has the tie keep, then you're absolutely able to do this. Laying it down flat. So when I'm doing the bow tie, I tell my students what we're going to do first we're going to take the tip of the big end. We're going to tuck it into the little part of that tie keep, which gives you this part of a triangle. Once you have this, again, I'm right-handed. So if you're left-handed, you're just going to reverse this in your power hand. I'm going to first fold the tie down. Okay. And then I'm going to fold it back. So at this part, this point, the seam is up facing. Okay. We're gonna do that one more time, lay that back down across. So at this point, we have something that looks like this with two flaps, one, two. Now, the most difficult part is this right here. So I normally go over this a few times. The seam is facing down, so you cannot see the seam in the middle of the tie. I want you to pinch, find the seam first and pinch it so that we're holding it with the index and thumb of my right hand. Again, that's my power hand. Once I have that seam and I'm pinching it, I'm going to now take the long skinny end in my left hand. I'm going to go down. I'm gonna go around. <laughs> and then I'm gonna lay it to the side where my thumb and my index finger are pointing, okay? Try that one more time. I'm gonna go down. I'm gonna go around. And then I'm gonna lay that towards the side where my thumb and my index finger are pointing. Once you have this part, I'm going to take the long end. I'm going to go ahead and tuck that into or underneath 
where we're holding now. This actually gives you, as you see, the traditional bow tie. Now, what we want to do now, as I'm pinching that middle, I want to pull it. I want to pull it as hard as I can. As you're pulling it, what you are doing is cinching in the sides, which gives you what the traditional bow tie should look like. At this point, you have a long, skinny end. We're going to take this here. We're going to bend over and tuck this around. Pull that through a little bit. So at this point, this is what you have. <laughs> If you put this around your neck and then pull this tighter, it's going to tighten it up. Once you have it around your neck, you can fold it down or around it, and then you have your traditional bow tie. So these, these are two ways that I've uh, utilized ties to not only bring conversational pieces, but to show the importance of what professionalism is and the confidence it brings as well. Thank you, Mr. Love. Man, this is, this is amazing, you know. Um, I learned how to tie a tie early when I was about 12. My pops, same thing, in the mirror. Yeah. And once I got it, you know, pop, 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 pop. You know, even I, I was telling you earlier, you know, a little dance move or something to remember. <laughs> um, but I appreciate, man, you bringing this. And for the audience out there, you know, um, if you really want to get into even knowing how to do a tie, knowing how to do a bow tie. Uh, Mr. Love showed you a level one and level two. There's actually a third level. But I told Mr. Mr. Love, you know what? We're going to hold up on a third level so that you, if you become interested, you can reach out to Mr. Love and say, hey, I saw level one. I saw level two. I think I'm ready for level three, you know? Please, um, let me know. And it's really interesting how you say that professionalism, right? We, we, <clears throat> we forget sometimes, you know, that it's that first impression. Very no true. matter what, they see you first impression. Uh, but Mr. Love, once again, thank you so much for coming by today and really sharing uh, your passion, your story, uh, even giving us or granting us the opportunity uh, to interview you and allow our viewers to know more about your academic journey. Because at the end of the day, Mr. Love, uh, when people are, are walking on campus and they see you, I want to be able to, hey, do a little shout out. Hey, that Mr. Love. Definitely. Hey, Mr. Love, look. Hey, I, I figured it out, you know? But before we end this interview, man, um, I know you're going to become a pop next couple months, man. It's really quick to our viewers out there. I, I want to make sure that we can get what is that emotion, what is that feeling as a man that you're feeling about becoming a father, man. So I was going to keep it professional. You're not going to get me that <laughs> emotional. Um, it's an amazing feeling. Um, coming from a background where my father was not around, um, in and out of jail, and um, it, my thought process of watching my mom struggle was when I get the opportunity to create my own family, I'm going to be a different person. Right. So right. not wanting to replicate the same cycles that we see so many times in our family. So many students that I've worked with or come across yeah. are also uh, just living without fathers yeah. and understanding what that does to yeah. individuals. So the process for me has been awesome. Um, awesome I'm it. thankful that yes, it, it did not happen before, Good. did not happen yeah. soon. I think I'm in a much better place mentally, financially. But I'm, I'm excited. She Good. should be here during the summer. Yeah. And the process of buying all the baby stuff, yes. I went ahead and put together yes. the crib and everything, yes. knowing that I have months in yeah. advance. But um, it's exciting. I'm so excited. Do we have a name or no? So we have a name. We okay. have a name. Are you allowed, not allowed, but are you able to share that? I am. Okay. And it's a, it's a funny story. As a kid, and I don't know, it may be a big kid, but as a kid, I always got interested in the Northern Lights. Interesting. I okay. watched a TV show that showed the Northern Lights one time, and it was just, it looked like a painting. It looked right. like God painted the sky. Right. And when I always told myself, I'm going to see that, I'm going to go and see those yeah. one day. So I got a chance, me and my fiance yeah, yeah. took a trip to Alaska. Right. Uh, end of 21, and we got a chance to see the Aurora Borealis, which is the official name. Gosh. For me, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my okay. life. So when we figured out that we were having a girl, yeah. we took a look at some girl names, right. and obviously it's an A, and I right. came through the list, and I was like, that's the one. Yeah. So I sent my fiance a list of the names that I picked out, but I was right. like, Aurora is the one that Aurora. I like the most. She was like, I like it too. 
And I told her why I had chose that. She was like, yeah, I can see it. So do me a big favor, because I'm a father. Okay. Of two daughters. Okay. I want you to look at that camera and send a message to Aurora, right? Or Aurora. I want you to send a message to her. You know, two months from now, she'll be here. So what would you want to tell her? Ah, quick message. Um, I prayed for you, and I'm so thankful that God gifted you to me and your mother, and I'm excited to be to you the father that I wish I had. Cool. That's what I'm saying. Mr. Michael Love, and hopefully Dr. Love. It's coming, it's coming. The future. Thank you so much for being here once again. All love. Once again, viewers, please subscribe and watch it, okay? Have a wonderful day. Hope to see you all.